Ben Howard, and this is my lecture on cross-cultural monasticism. Cross-cultural. As you can see, if you found me in the refectory of a Chinese monastery, I might have difficulties. But then again, I might not. I was recently at a monastery in New Mexico. And I remember one meal, we were, we were eating all together, the monks and us guests, and I looked over and I saw some monks eating American style, just like me, and some monks eating in a British style, and then one other monk eating with chopsticks. Maybe the Chinese monks would let me eat with a fork. What I also noticed at this monastery in New Mexico was that all of the monks, all of the monks from 13 different countries sang Gregorian chant. Some of it in Latin. A style of music that was unfamiliar to nearly everybody, no matter where we live. Regarding what habits do we give permission for people of different cultures to differ? When do we expect ourselves to learn new habits in order to participate in another culture? Or in order to welcome people from another culture into relationship with us? When do we expect everybody to do the same thing? And then, what about those times when we're simply unaware that we're experiencing cultural differences, but we just don't seem to understand one another? One of the facts of the 21st century is globalization. Those big, wide oceans that used to separate nations and races and religions and perspectives are now getting smaller and smaller. Cities like Los Angeles, Toronto, New York, London, Singapore, these cities are all becoming something of a microcosm of the globe itself. Now, these cities may still have their distinct neighborhoods, so you've got Little Italy, you've got Chinatown, things like that, but when you go to work, you are still going to be getting along and meeting with people from all over the world as you work, and you'll be sitting around the same conference tables. And even if, even if you live in a rural environment or whatever it might be, and you don't have the same kind of international diversity physically, still, you have a, um, you're, the whole world is at your front door through the media. I mean, for example, I, I mean, I never really tried to count exactly, but I bet I have Facebook friends from over 20 countries, and definitely from every continent, except Antarctica. Now, when you think about it, that is some virtual conversation. So that brings up the question, how do we navigate cultural differences in a globalized society? One of the facts of monastic history is cross-cultural expansion. It all started with the Apostle Paul, who argued that in Christ, quote, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, this fundamental unity in Christ impelled Paul to become all things to all people, voluntarily tailoring his message and his life habits in the context of different cultures. You see, and it is, furthermore, it is clear to me that the Apostle Paul, for the most part, followed the pattern, or shall I say, the rule of life, given by Jesus for his own itinerant ministers. Remaining single, carrying few possessions, working only when necessary, and so on. 
Perhaps then, it would be fair to say that the Pauline missionary teams planting churches around the Mediterranean were the first cross-cultural missionary order. Now, monasticism after Paul had its own cultural differences. When you read the literature of the period, you can notice this right away. The early monks of Syria and Palestine exhibit a different character from the monks in Egypt. John Cashin wrote his institutes and his conferences in order to assist French expressions to appropriate the practices of Egypt for their own place and time. The early Jesuits explored the horizons of cultural adaptation as they multiplied their numbers throughout the world in the 16th century and beyond. A semi-monastic community of women following the lead of St. Charles de Foucault, known as the Little Sisters of Jesus, now number around 1,300 women from 67 nationalities living in 70 countries around the world. Monasticism has always faced cultural diversity. But perhaps cultural issues come up most often when talking about those monastic communities that developed in early medieval Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, known as what we call Celtic monasticism or Celtic spirituality. Now, in another lecture, I will summarize the history and character of Celtic monasticism in general. Here, I just want to talk about um, cultural issues. Everything in Celtic monastic spirituality from evangelism strategy to interest in angels, has been attributed to cross-cultural adaptation, or, uh, to use other words, blamed on religious syncretism, depending on how you think about the whole thing. I think it is fair to say that St. Patrick himself saw himself as a cross-cultural missionary. Scholars debate Patrick's association with mon monasticism, Though in his confessions, he clearly makes mention of the sons and daughters of Irish leaders becoming, quote, monks and virgins. Indeed, in the past 30 years, virtually every aspect of the history of Irish monastic history has come under scrutiny. Nevertheless, I feel comfortable mentioning three aspects of early Irish monasticism that illustrate the issues of cultural diversity. First, there is the role and the structure of the monastery itself in early medieval Irish society. What became clear to me in my studies and in my visits to the sites is that early Irish monasteries are probably better understood as settlements that emerged as followers collected around Christian heroes and heroines that modeled an attractive life and mediated the power of God. The development of monasteries from saint to small following to something near a village and into a loose network of associated villages, this pattern of development reminds me actually as much of Irish petty kingdoms and tribal culture as they do the monasteries of France, Italy, or um, in Egypt, where, where this all began. Second, I think that the Irish emphasis on and style of education carries something of its Celtic or even Druid heritage. The Druid masters were sages, teachers, magicians, advisors. Followers joined the school of a Druid master much as people join the academy of Plato just by hanging around the places where he taught. But it's more developed in Irish Druid culture, and particularly in Christianity. From the start, Celtic saints founded similar schools within the perimeters of their settlements, and they became more formal as these schools and, their, and the settlements grew. Places like Clonard, 
Claude McNoise and Iona became internationally recognized in their own time as centers of learning. Once again, I see a mix of, of particularly Christian education principles and then cultural adaptation in the development of these early Irish monastic schools. Third, and finally, I think that the intensity of Irish formation communicates a mix of Egyptian and Irish cultures. Whereas Cashin or Benedict, I think, sought to soften the harsh asceticism of their Egyptian heritage and desert practice for the sake of Italian and French population, I think that sometimes the severe asceticism of the early Irish rules and penitentials and lives actually reflects a society that praises that very intensity and idealizes people who take themselves right to the edge. It is hard to say how self-conscious all this cross-cultural adaptation was. Some of it might just have been the natural way to live as community together. Some of it probably just happened as local followers sought to live near the access of the power of God. Yet, still, I suspect that some of these developments were carefully considered, especially as these expressions encounter dialogue with Rome and England about their practices. Which then brings us to the question of how do we do cross-cultural new monasticism? As new monastic communities relocate into areas of need, they are often relocating into unfamiliar cultures. Increasingly, new friars groups worldwide are recruiting members from indigenous cultures. Furthermore, globalization is bringing people of many cultures together who are together interested in exploring these kinds of new monastic expressions. We will and we must face the possibilities and the problems of cultural diversity. I offer three simple suggestions here as we consider monasticism and cultural diversity. First, because of the gospel, our expressions of Christian religious life must be open to being multicultural. I mentioned I visited a monastery in New Mexico that had members from 13 different countries. Well, while I was there, I had an opportunity to have a special talk with Brother Noah, one of the monks, and we talked about this very issue. Here is what he had to say about the question. So yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I think that the really, st you know, the, the, the most important thing is openness. I mean, if, if uh, you know, in, in a chapter 58 of the rule, again, you know, St. Benedict says, test the spirits to see if they come from God. Hmm. Um, you know, he doesn't say, uh, you know, only admit the guy if he speaks the same language as the rest of the community. <laughs> he doesn't say, only admit the guy if he likes the food that's put out. At the, if it's food that he's familiar with. He's, you know, he doesn't say only admit the guy if he has the same cultural background as the rest of the community, if he has the same level of education, if he has the same likes and dislikes in terms of books and movies and things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the only thing that he's really, you know, the sole determining criterion for St. Benedict is, you know, has the Holy Spirit led him to the monastery? And if the answer is yes, I don't think St. Benedict particularly cared whether he came from Malawi or Vietnam or Korea or, or wherever. We have no option. Christ and Benedict bids us to welcome any who would join together in pursuit of God. Now, it will be complicated doing this, and it will be awkward at times, but it is right. Brother Noah tells this delightful story about their own experience at this monastery and this awkwardness in, in a situation and, and shares how it was resolved. 
I mean, the spiritual community of the Monastery of Christ in the Desert is no doubt enriched by the fact that there's 13 or 14 countries represented here. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. Yeah, yeah. When I was a postulant, several brothers were going to the local clinic in Abiquiu to get flu shots. Uh, we were driven there by the novice master. He was having some weird medical problem. He had an appointment a couple, three hours later. So we all got our flu shots. And then we had like two or three hours we had to kill before his appointment was going to be over. And all of us are just sort of milling about, not knowing what to do with each other. Because, you know, we don't speak the same language. We haven't had... I mean, with the Americans, I can start quoting Star Wars and, like, they'll quote Star Wars back at me. You know, we have a postulant. We have an American postulant right now who told me yesterday, we went on a hike, he can have a three-hour conversation with his dad where they do nothing but quote SpongeBob SquarePants episodes at each other. You know, I mean, this is, this is American. You know, like, but if you try to do that with a kid from Kerala, India, he's not going to know what you're talking right, about. You know, yes. um, the cultural signifiers are different. And so here we all are, and we don't know what to do. So somebody gets the brilliant idea. Well, there's a Catholic church just up the hill, you know, uh, Santa Tomas the Apostle. So we go up the hill, the parish secretary lets us in, and we go into the church, and then we're in silence. And some brothers are doing Lexio Divina, and some brothers are, you know, making a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament, and some brothers are praying the rosary, and some brothers are reading the Bible that they brought with them. And I thought to myself, this is what we know how to do together. <laughs> we can pray together. Like, even if we're not praying the divine office, we're still together in this room, you know, all nations have streamed towards the Lord's Mountain. Because when I say the Lord's Mountain, I don't mean this monastery yeah, yeah, exclusively. Yeah. I do mean this monastery, but I mean the church, wherever the church is. Yeah. Second, because of the circumstances, our expressions of Christian religious life may need to become cross-cultural. The Christian gospel reaches out with love. Monasteries multiply. And when this happens, and especially in circumstances where Christianity or monastic life would not be understood in the garb of one culture, then it is necessary to redress the forms of religious life in the clothing of a new culture. One excellent example of this in the 20th century was the founding of the Karusi Mala Ashram in India. The aim was to found a contemplative or even Cistercian monastery in India that would resonate with the rich heritage of communities of spiritual pursuit in that country. So on March 20th, 1958, Francis, Acharya, and Bede Griffith, and a couple of others, moved up to Karusi Mala, the mountain of the cross. There they struggled with the economy, with the liturgy, with the community, and all that it takes to found an intentional religious order, or monastery in this sense. And over the decades, they ultimately established one of the most influential models of culturally sensitive Catholic monasticism in India. A beautiful story. This is a delicate operation, of course, because monasticism is a very intentional way of life. And one must be careful not to destroy the authentic expression of life in the process of dressing it into another culture's clothing. New monastic expressions have to be very sensitive about such matters because as they relocate into areas of need, and there are many new monastic expressions doing just this, they are often relocating cross-culturally. The term often used to describe this kind of ministry is incarnational ministry or incarnational mission. It depends on how people talk about this. Just as Jesus was the Almighty God and incarnated into our midst in the form of a human, so we as living expressions of the Church of Christ literally move into neighborhoods and share life with folks on their turf and in their cultural forms. This is incarnational ministry. I suspect that just as the Celtic monastic communities discovered themselves and found ways to embody the gospel in their own forms of devotion, so we as new monastic expressions of the gospel and life of Christ step 
in to neighborhoods cross-culturally and empower others to live wholeheartedly with, with and for God. We will be surprised to discover many new fresh expressions coming out of each of these cultural atmospheres of new expressions of religious life, each with its own distinct and delightful flavor. Finally, I think that all our steps toward planting culturally sensitive expressions of Christian religious life is made easier because Christian religious life is itself fundamentally cross-cultural. So here's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Is that perhaps one of the things that can ameliorate multicultural monasticism is the fact that a Benedictine monastery itself is a third culture. Hmm. A counterculture that no matter who you are, yeah. you've got to figure out. I mean, even the you know, the white, the wasp coming yeah. in from here, uh, it still is going to have some adjustment to do. I think you're, ex I think you put your finger on it. I mean, in, in a sense, I don't, I mean, we're using the word monastery to describe that third culture, but I actually think that the, the better term would probably be the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. This has been an aim of religious life throughout its history, to exhibit the kingdom of God, itself a culture which transcends the culture of humanity. In my lecture on what is monasticism, I outline five characteristics, di uh, characteristic dimensions of the religious life. The pursuit of God, or the formational ascetical dimension. Serious commitment, or the intentional dimension. A way of life, or the ordered dimension. The life of prayer, or the mystical dimension. And alternative culture, or the identity dimension. Now, if we think of culture as a shared pattern of community activities like education or business or family life or entertainment or so on, if that's what culture is all about, how we share those things, then I mean, we can take, just see by a cursory look at monasticisms, old and new, that we are dealing with a third culture, intentional forms of living eating, housing, relating to one another, entertainment, and so on, which run somewhat counter to nearly all worldly cultures. And that is the point. Monasticism is fundamentally an alternative culture, a different way of living. And, and for this reason, all who come to join no matter what language or nation or ethnicity, we'll have to learn the Christian culture. We'll have to learn how we practice humility. We'll have to learn how we practice silence and prayer. We'll have to learn self-sacrificial giving. We will have to become acquainted with the power of God. This, you see, is what makes monasticism difficult. But in an odd way, I think it is also what makes cross-cultural monasticism easy. We all together have the same struggles to enter the narrow gate into the kingdom of God. And as you open your own gate into the kingdom of God, may you have a wonderful day.